In this video, I'm actually going to go through some work examples that relate to the lesson on vectors as forces. So there is already an existing video where I go through this lesson, and I'm just going to now jump ahead to some worked examples that relate to this topic. So first thing we're going to do, take a look here. It's still relatively simple. We've got two forces. They are 32 newtons and 58 newtons. They're acting at an angle of 45 degrees to each other and we're asked to find the resultant force. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up our situation. And when you do that, one of the things you're going to want to do is you're going to want to choose the situation or choose the um, choose your drawing to make it as convenient for you as possible. You won't always have the choice of doing this, but in this case, I'm just told I have these two forces, but I'm not told anything else about them. So we're told that we have two forces. The first one is 32 newtons, so I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to choose 32 newtons and I'm going to lay it along the horizontal in the what's going to be the positive x direction. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And then my second force acts at an angle of 45 degrees and so I'm going to choose that second force which is 58 newtons and it's acting at an angle of 45 degrees so I'm going to choose to have that angle be counterclockwise to the first force because that's going to put that second force the result of the way I've set this up, if I say that that's my x-axis and that's my y-axis, by choosing this the way I have, my first force is entirely along the x-axis, and that's much easier to deal with because it's only going to have an x component. And my second force is in the positive x and the positive y direction. It's got a piece that goes to the right, that's in the positive x. It has a piece that goes up, and that's the positive y. So we are being asked to determine the resultant force. So if I look at each of these individually, the first one is just this. So that's 32 newtons. And the second one is looks like that. And I'm going to also draw in a horizontal there. So we've got 32 newtons, we have 58 newtons, and we have an angle of 45 degrees. Now, the reason I'm doing this, the reason I'm breaking this up and looking at my two forces separately, so I'm just going to call this one F1, and I'm going to call this one F2. The reason I'm doing this, the reason I'm looking at these two forces separately, is because one of the focuses of what we're doing here is the idea of vector components. So if I break these up into their vector components, then the way I can write this is I can say that F1 in the x direction is equal to the magnitude of F1 multiplied by the angle or multiplied by uh, the angle that this vector makes with in this case with the x axis. So it's entirely in the x direction here and so it's actually just the magnitude of F1 multiplied by the i vector and that is just the same as 32 multiplied by the i vector. Whereas the F1 and the y this force F1 has no, has no contribution in the y direction. It lies entirely along the x direction. And so that one is going to be 0 in the j direction. Similarly, it might be more convenient for me to break this one up into its horizontal and vertical components. And so when I do that, that's a right angle. And so I end up with F2 in the x direction. That's going to be this blue part right here. So there is F2 
in the X and you'll have to just ignore that arrow on that end and I'll accentuate the arrow to the right. So F2 in the X direction is pointing here to the right. And similarly, similarly, F2 in the Y direction, I'm going to ignore that arrow down there and I'm going to emphasize that we are going up. So when I look at my components, F2 in the X direction is going to be, first of all, I notice that it's going to the right. So I know it's positive. And it's going to be the magnitude of F2. And see, I can write this a different way. This time I'm not going to write the sine or cosine inside the absolute value because I'm dealing with an acute angle here. So I know that I just now have to use my right angle trigonometry. This is the adjacent side, so that goes along with cosine. So that ends up being the magnitude of F2 cosine of 45 degrees. And this is in the I vector direction. And so that works out to be 58 cosine of 45 degrees is root 2 over 2 in the I direction. And so that could also be written as 29 root 2 in the I direction. So that's the X component to this one. F2 in the Y direction is going to be, that's our red vector here, it's, it's up and we've defined up as being positive. So that's in the positive Y direction. You don't need to put these plus signs in there. I'm just putting, putting them in to be really explicit and clear. It's the magnitude of F2. And this is the opposite side. So that's going to be the sine of 45 degrees. And it turns out sine and cosine of 45 degrees are both root 2 over 2. So this one is also 29 root 2 in size, but this one is actually in the J direction. And if I want to find my resultant vector, so F R, and that's a vector, that's going to be equal to F1 as a vector plus F2 as a vector. But F1 as a vector is 32i plus 0j. And I'm going to add to that 29 root 2i plus 29 root 2j. Another way we could have written this, we could have written this in component form. Let me just do that kind of as an aside. I could have also written this as the vector 32, 0, plus 29 root 2, comma, 29 root 2. But since I'm working with i's and j's, I'm going to stick with that. So I end up with 32i plus 29 root 2i. So 32 plus 29 root 2 times the i vector plus 0j plus 29 root 2 is just 29 root 2 times the j vector. We could have gotten a similar answer, of course, of course, from component form. You might take this further. You might actually resolve these into numbers. This is technically, this is an answer. This is a vector that represents the final answer. Now what it comes down to is, well, how were you how are you expected to present your final answer? And you're going to need a little bit more clarity. For example, coming from me on a test, you would need something to make this a little more clear. Otherwise, this would be an acceptable answer. But let's take a look at the original question again. Determine the resultant force. Our original question was given in terms of vectors with the magnitude of the vectors and the direction of the vectors. So it would actually make sense for us to give our final answer in the same way. And to do that, it might not be the worst idea to make use of what we've learned so far about vectors in the idea of if those are my two original vectors, there's my F1 and there's my F2. If I want to add these together, then I have to add them tip to tail, which means I have to take F2 and I have to translate it over to here. And then I end up with a resultant vector 
that looks like that. So again, let me just emphasize that arrow and make that little arrow insignificant. We're not paying any attention to that end. So this is my FR. That's my resultant vector along there. And this is the result of my vector addition. So the x component of this resultant vector, if I redraw it on its own over here, there's an x component that goes along the x-axis. So this is the resultant vector in the x direction. And this is the resultant vector in the y direction. But the resultant vector in the x direction is this value. The resultant vector in the y direction is this value. And so I could also, another way that I could do this, is I could report my answer in terms of my total resultant vector magnitude, which is the length of that side, and in terms of this angle. And so, for example, the magnitude of this side, that would come from Pythagorean theorem. So the magnitude of my resultant vector is equal to, well, actually, it's going to be squared. The magnitude of my resultant vector squared is equal to the magnitude of my resultant vector in the x, which is this one, squared, plus the magnitude of my resultant vector in the y all squared. And that's just Pythagorean theorem. So in the x we have 32 plus 29 root 2 all squared plus 29 root 2 all squared. And if we just want the magnitude of our resultant vector, we would take the positive square root of that whole thing. Let's try that again. The magnitude of my resultant vector is equal to the positive square root of that whole thing. Now this angle, and I'm not, I'm not going to worry about that number, I'll let you do that calculation. That's the length of this side. And then for this angle, we would say, in this case, the tangent of the angle theta would be equal to, and again we're into triangles now, so it's the absolute value or the magnitude of the resultant vector in the y direction divided by the, that's the opposite side, over the adjacent side, which is the absolute value of the resultant vector in the x direction. And it's easy to get caught up with the fact that we've got all of these other things going on and vector components and these absolute value symbols and the vector signs. But this is just Pythagorean theorem and right angle trigonometry. And if you just take a step back and relax, you realize that this is stuff that you are very comfortable with and you're very good at if you kind of stop looking at all the white noise that's happening in the background. And so from this one, we can also find this angle theta. And that would be another way that we could report this. So we could say, for example, that our resultant vector or the resultant force is this magnitude at an angle of theta above the horizontal, where the horizontal was how I defined it at the beginning of the question. Okay, now here we have another example where I have a 20 kilogram trunk is resting on a ramp. It is resting on a ramp. That means it's not moving and that brings us back to the idea of equilibrium which is something I mentioned in the previous lesson, the definition I gave in the previous lesson. The thing I want to highlight here, there's a couple of things that we need to cover here. Again, this is mostly for people who are new to this idea of force vectors and working with forces in general. So I guess the first thing I want to point out is that when you're dealing with gravity, the magnitude of your gravitational force is given by m times g where m is the mass of the object involved and g is what's known as it's generally referred to as the acceleration due to gravity but in our case we are referring to it as the force that gravity exerts per kilogram of the object involved so whether you regardless of what you call it small letter g is nine approximately 9.8 newtons per kilogram where newtons is a force. So 
if we multiply by a mass this is going to give us a total force and it's going to give us the force of gravity so that's this part right here the force of gravity acts always acts towards the center of the earth and so in this case it's going to act down so now I've defined down is the center of the earth but one of the things that I want to point out with this example or this exercise is that you can choose your x and y axes in a way that's convenient to you so when I say calculate the components of the force of gravity on the trunk that are parallel to and perpendicular to the ramp what I'm doing in this case is I'm actually doing the same thing I did in that previous example except for now I'm going to choose my x and y to be my x I've decided to put up the ramp and my y I've decided to be perpendicular to the ramp still in an upward direction but perpendicular so other than this discussion over here about gravity the the thing I really want to illustrate to you is how do we deal with this kind of off kilter x and y axis and so the way that I do that is let's see I guess I'll use this one so the way that I do that is I actually draw in some well I wanted I want to draw in components for this force that are actually along these uh, x and y axes as I've defined them so the y part is actually going to be a line that goes like this and the x part is going to be a line that goes like that and now I have to do just a little bit of creative arrow drawing I don't want the arrow on this end I just want the arrow down here so gravity goes along this y-axis and in particular it goes in the negative y-axis and the way I've drawn it I also have something going down the incline and that one is also in the negative x direction I could have chosen my x direction to be down the incline I could have chosen my y direction to actually be perpendicular but down from the incline as well these are chosen for your convenience but sometimes it's also a good idea to, to, to go with your intuition and things that you're already familiar with now now that I've drawn this I've got a right angle triangle the only thing I need to do is figure out well what's this angle and you can probably see just from looking at it you might suspect well hey that looks like 15 degrees and as a matter of fact it is 15 degrees but you need to be able to do better than that you need to be able to show that that's the case and it's actually not that difficult to show so let's switch to another color so we can show this gravity acts straight down this is the horizontal so 90 degrees plus 15 degrees that means this corner is actually 65 degrees I have drawn this red dotted line at a right angle to the platform or to the incline so that's 90 degrees which means over here on this other side is 90 degrees but part of that 90 degrees is taken up by this angle which is 65 so what remains on the inside is 90 minus 65 which of course means I haven't done my arithmetic properly because this actually should have been let's see 65 70 yeah I just can't do math it's a good thing I'm not a math teacher or anything along those lines so that's actually supposed to be 75 degrees and then this actually the arithmetic works out for this so we have 15 degrees left over inside here and now we go ahead now that we've shown that this angle inside here is 15 degrees we see that in this case the y component actually goes with the adjacent side so this time the y component is going to go with cosine so my force of gravity in the y direction so let's get a couple of things taken care of here first of all this is in the negative y direction so I have to put a negative sign there and it's going to be the magnitude of the force of gravity which I'm just going to go ahead and do this for now 
and it's going to be in this case the cosine of 15 degrees and it's in my y direction which is the j vector now another way I could have done this or I could have written this as the force of gravity in the y direction is equal to and I could have just said the force of gravity magnitude times the cosine of 15 degrees and then I could have said that's multiplied by the negative j vector where there I'm saying it's pointing down either of those is perfectly fine now what is the magnitude of the force of gravity well that is equal to mg which is equal to in this case we had a mass of 20 kilograms multiplied by 9.8 and that's approximate because it's approximately 9.8 which means this is approximately equal to and so that would be 98 196 so now we get the negative 196 times the cosine of 15 degrees times the j vector which is equal to and actually this is now approximate and it's going to be a further approximation because I'm going to do 196 times the cosine of 15 degrees and I have to make sure I'm actually in degrees so make sure your calculator is set to degree mode when you do this 196 times the cosine of 15 degrees is equal to approximately 189.3 and my force of gravity in the x direction oh I almost forgot to put my j vector there the force of gravity in the x direction is going to be again we recognize that it's going to be negative 196 but this time the x component is actually across from or opposite to that 15 degrees so that's the sine of 15 degrees and now that's in the i direction so that is equal to 196 times the sine of 15 degrees and this is going to be relatively small it's approximately and that's approximate negative 50.7 and that's going to be in the i direction And so now that I've written these in their component forms, I could also write that the force of gravity, as far as I'm concerned, we are now done because we've been asked for the components of gravity. We could also write this as the force of gravity is actually equal to, did I miss the minus sign here? I did. So the x component is negative 50.7 and the y component is 189.7. Three. That would be another way. Or we could write it like this. That's in component form using the bracket notation. So you have lots of options when it comes to this. And finally, let's wrap it up with this example or this exercise. We have a mass of 20 kilograms suspended from a ceiling by two lengths of rope that make angles of 60 degrees and 45 degrees with the ceiling determine the tension in each of the ropes now first of all tension is just what happens when you pull a rope tight and pulling a rope tight comes from exerting a force so tension is a force that's the first thing we need to understand from there we are going to also a mass is suspended from the ceiling by two lengths but that means this mass is just kind of hanging there and so as a result we have a state of equilibrium okay and so that tells us that when we add up all of our vectors together we're going to end up with the zero vector so what are our vectors well I'm going to call this vector t1 and I'm going to call this vector t2 those are my tension 1 and tension 2 forces and then down here I have my force of gravity now in order to do this the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and write my vector equation because I have equilibrium I know that when I add my tension 1 and my tension 2 and my force of gravity all as vectors I'm going to end up with the zero vector 
But that is the same thing as saying that since the zero vector, and let me just kind of focus in on that for a second, the zero vector is the same thing as saying I have zero in the i direction plus zero in the j direction. So that means that I can actually break my problem up into the x direction and the y direction. And of course the x direction refers to the i vector and the y direction refers to the j vector. And for consistency I should include somewhere near my diagram what I'm going to be referring to as my x direction and my y direction or what my positive x and positive y are. So in my x direction what that means the vector equation there is that t1 in the x plus t2 in the x plus force of gravity in the x has to be equal to 0i and t1 in the y plus t2 in the y plus the force of gravity in the y has to be equal to 0 times the j vector. And this is all because we're in equilibrium. Now sometimes carrying around all of these vectors can get quite inconvenient. And one of the things that we do to deal with this is we make an assumption about whether or not these values are positive and negative. And so another way that this is often written is you will see this. So I'm going to write it. Let me write it first. Sometimes you'll see that where all of the vector symbols have been dropped. And this is an acceptable thing to do, but you need to understand what it is you're doing here. When I write it this way, I'm not saying absolute value. These can be plus or minus. They can be positive or negative. So if I get a positive value, it means that it's to the right. If I get a negative value, it means it's to the left. And in this case, actually, I wouldn't normally write it this way because from my diagram, it kind of looks like T2 has to be to the left. So I would, I would assume that. I would assume that T2 is to the left. But for now, let's just go ahead and let's break these things up into their respective components. And you might want to do this with separate diagrams. So we have T1, which was the one that was up here to the right, and it made an angle of 45 degrees. That's this one right here. It made an angle of 45 degrees with the ceiling, which means it also makes an angle of 45 degrees with the horizontal, which means it has a component along the side here, which is going to be that T1 in the x direction is going to be equal to, and so I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to say that's positive in the x direction, and that's going to be positive the magnitude of T1 times the cosine of 45 degrees. And again, now I'm going to show you, this is generally how it's done in physics. We normally would just say T1 times the cos of 45 degrees, which is root 2 over 2. And in this case, T1 is assumed to be positive because T1 is actually the magnitude of the vector. So T1 in this case is just the magnitude of the vector T1. And that can be confusing. The x and y components can be positive or negative, but the overall vector itself, that just means magnitude. So you need to think carefully. I'm showing this to you because this is a convenient way of doing this, and a lot of people who've done the physics course will be familiar with this, but you need to decide whether or not you're comfortable doing it this way. And the y component here, which is going to look like this, t1 in the y direction is also going to be positive 
it's also going to be the magnitude of T1. And in this case, it's going to be the sine of 45 degrees, which is equal to T1. And it turns out sine and cosine of 45 degrees are both root 2 over 2. And I'm going to leave those in their current form for now. Next thing I do is I take a look at my vector T2. And that vector was going that way. And that one made an angle of 60 degrees with the ceiling. But that also means it makes an angle of 60 degrees with the horizontal down here. And so now my vector components are t2 in the x. But in this case, we can see that, first of all, it's in the negative x direction, so it's minus. t2 has a sign. It can be positive or negative. In this case, it's negative. And it's going to be the magnitude of t2 multiplied by the cosine of 60 degrees. And if you need to, you can refer to your special triangles, 1, 2, root 3, 30 degrees, 60 degrees. The cosine of 60 degrees is equal to a half. So that's just equal to negative T2 over 2. And my y component, T2 in the y direction, is a positive value multiplied by the magnitude of T2 multiplied by the sine of 60 degrees. The sine of 60 degrees is root 3 over 2. So that's going to be t2 times root 3 over 2. So now we have sorted those ones out. What about the force of gravity? Well, that one is actually fairly easy to do. I could almost do that one right here. It's only pointing downwards. So the force of gravity in the x direction is equal to 0. And the force of gravity in the y direction, no, no vector symbol this time, is equal to its negative, because it's going down. And we know that's negative mg, which is equal to negative 20 times 9.8. But that's an approximation. So that's equal to approximately negative 196. And we're going to make use of all of these where I had these values. So let's go one more time. And I'm going to write so t1 in the x direction plus t2 in the x direction plus fg in the x direction has to be equal to 0 times the i vector, which is the same thing as saying t1 in the x, which is, so that's the same thing as saying t1 in the x. Actually, let's go back and do that all in one color to start. t1 in the x plus t2 in the x plus f g in the x is equal to 0. And then I can start to fill those in. t1 in the x is this one. That's just equal to t1 times root 2 over 2 plus t2 in the x, which is over here. And that is negative t2 over 2. And fg in the x is equal to 0. So that's plus 0 equals 0. And as a result of this, what I end up with is actually I can multiply everything through by 2. And that gets rid of these fractions. And then what I end up with over here is root 2 t1 minus t2 equals 0. Or I get root 2 t1 equals t2. So now I have a relationship between tension 1 and tension 2. And to sort that out, I'm going to use my y direction, which says that t1 in the y plus t2 in the y plus fg in the y is equal to 0. t1 in the y, if we go up here, it's right here, it's root 2 
So that's equal to t1 root 2 over 2 plus t2 in the y, which was this one, t2 root 3 over 2 plus fg in the y, which I think we found was negative 196, that's equal to 0. And so we can, well, we can do a couple of things here, but we're down to two equations and two unknowns. And I think the simplest thing for us to do is to take this value of t2 and say instead it's root 2 times t1. So I end up with t1 times root 3 over 2 plus, but instead of t2, I'm actually going to put root 2 t1 times this was root 2 over 2, not root 3 over 2. This one is root 3 over 2. And that's equal to, if I take the 196 over to the other side, and all of this is actually approximate, because this was an approximate value, the 196. And I might want to get rid of these unsightly fractions. I'm going to multiply everything by 2. So I get t1 root 2 plus t1 root 2 times root 3 is equal to root 6 is equal to approximately 196 times 2 is going to be 392. And now I factor out my t1 and that's root 2 plus root 6 equals approximately 392 which means t1 is approximately equal to 392 divided by root 2 plus root 6. And since we're already dealing with approximate values and I want a number to actually make sense of here, we actually go ahead and we give an approximate answer for this. So that's 392 divided by the square root of 2 plus the square root of 6. And that turns out to be equal to approximately 101.5. And now that I know t1, I can come up here and I can say that t2 is equal to root 2 of that value, 101.5. And that's approximately equal to, so I take that, I keep everything in my calculator, multiply that by the square root of 2, and I end up with 143.5. And we do need to keep track of which one goes where. So T1 is the one to the right, and T2 is the one to the left. So that was the 45 degree. Therefore, the rope at 45 degrees has a tension of 101.5 newtons and at 60 degrees has a tension of 143.5 newtons. And if you made it through all of that, well, congratulations, because you have reached the end of this supplementary video. And there, once again, are the assigned homework questions.